This is another episode of The Right Life Podcast, your number one source for everything bariatric surgery, from pre op to post op. Registered dietitian Alex Conception gives you real, raw tips and motivation through your journey. This is The Right Life Podcast. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Right Life Podcast. I am here with an awesome, awesome dude. He is my friend and old colleague, I guess. This is Dr. Damon McCune. Did I pronounce your last name right? You did. <laughs> yes. Okay. Because I, I remember always calling him McCune. And I was like, and I heard <laughs> one time say McCune. I was like, man, I've been pronouncing that wrong for years. But they um, called me one. <laughs> well, Dr. Damon McCune, he is a registered dietitian. He is a doctor in exercise physiology. <laughs> exercise physiology. Um, he is the co-author of The Vertical Diet with Stan Efferding. And um, what else? What else is there, bro? <laughs> On that uh, right. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of a lot of cool experiences. Um, was the director of nutrition program at UNLV. Um my background's in metabolic disease and my research is around human performance um, and nutritional strategies and to, to accomplish that. Uh, currently working in medical affairs um, in, in biotech and pharma. So yeah, I think that kind of leads into what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> Super smart guy and the perfect person I want to talk to with this audience, you know, um, metabolic disease, right? Specifically what I want to talk about today um, knowing that you're in pharma is the hot topic of weight loss drugs, right? You can't go two seconds without hearing about Ozempic if you mention weight management. So what what's been your what's been your history with with uh, weight loss drugs? Sure. Um, well, really quick disclaimer. So I don't work for any of the companies that produce these these drugs, um, but I've worked with a lot of uh, patients and clients who who have been around or use these. Um, you know, for, for those out there who might be new to this area, these um, some of these drugs are fairly new, but some of them have been around for quite a long time. So um, we can we can kind of get into that. There's there's pros and cons to all of it. I think the big take home is that they are all indicated as an adjunctive therapy, which means you know a complement to lifestyle change. Um, and so the cornerstone is still going to be that. You said a lot of them have been around for a long time. What what are some of those like classic drugs? Sure, I think the more classic drugs are going to be the fentramethapyramid, um, which the the brand name is uh, Qsimia, and from my understanding, I believe their patents running out at the end of this year, so that will be going generic um, at the end of twenty four. Oh, Qsimia, just fentramine now. Yeah, that's been around for a long time, and I remember it was there was a um, fenfen, right? Fentramine yeah. and fluramine, a lot of people died from that with that combination, but it's it's going to be, uh, but fentramine, I guess, is, is really good. What, what are the, I know that it's prescribed a lot, and I know a lot of people that have been on fentramine. Is that is that typically like a first line of defense when it comes to weight loss drugs? Kind of depends on the provider, um, but I would say, yeah, that's probably a, a basic starting point. That or um, sometimes the uh, sex endo. Um, which is the liver uh, which is going to increase uh, insulin. So I think we should probably take a real quick step back and talk about like what what these different drugs are and kind of like the different classes just to kind of set yeah. set up mind. So um, with Ozempic and um, Wagovi, Manjaro, Zepam. So these are in the incretin mimetic category, and so these are essentially like hormone um, mimicking drugs. The fentramine to pyramid is actually a combination. So fentramine is a, is a amphetamine, it's a stimulant. And so it's an appetite suppressant. It will also increase uh, metabolism a little bit. To pyramid is an anticonvulsant. And so that also works at the points of the, the brain where they're essentially your, your pleasure centers. And so it changes how your body responds to food. Um, it can change mouthfeel, it can change flavor. And so it may not be as appealing um, to eat. Uh, and again, it, it may reduce appetite. Um, the larigotide, again, it's, it's kind of a, um, it's a hormone manipulation, essentially. It's increasing insulin. Uh, and then Orlif stat, we haven't brought that up yet, but that used to be pretty popular. So think about like the ally and things like that. So the, the Orlif stat is a, um, it's, it's reducing the uh, gastric and pancreatic lipase 
And so essentially you don't absorb the, the lipids or the fats that you're taking in. And so that can lead to some really undesirable side effects. Um, and so that really lost popularity pretty quickly due to a lot of that. So um, I think that's a pretty good baseline. Yeah. For, yeah. And then, um, so leading into like the, the hot stuff, let's let's talk about these ingredients and mimetics. And so um, Ozempic and Wagovia are both made by Nova Nordisk. Uh, it's, those are semaglutide, that's the actual compound. It's their compound. Um, so this is something that's working as a GLP-1 agonist. And so um, essentially what this is doing is increasing your glucagon, which will reduce your insulin type of a thing. Um, and so it, it's helpful in the sense of it may help you regulate your blood sugars. It may help you regulate your appetite. Um, and so the only difference between Ozempic and Wagovi is the indication. And so I think that's something that's also important for people to know is that some of these drugs are the same compound. There might just be a different indication, a different dosage. Yeah, and, and to correct myself earlier, I, I said it backwards. So the GLP-1 agonists, um, they're going to work uh, on the GLP-1 receptor, but instead of inhibiting insulin, they're going to inhibit glucagon. So it's going to slow gastric emptying um, and then go on from there. And which one is that? Is that some Got it. Got it. Awesome. Good clarification. And so Nova also makes uh, Rebelsis, which is the oral compound. Now, this is an interesting compound uh, because the incretimimetics, the semaglutides and the terzepatides, we're going to talk about in a minute, these are peptides. And so insulin is a peptide. And that's why they are injectable because peptides, our gut is designed to essentially break these peptides down. And once you break down these peptides, they're no longer that thing. And so they don't act the same way. Rebelsis has a essentially like a shuttle system to survive the GI and get into to the bloodstream. Um, the dosage is very different and there's different side effects associated with this. So, um, for the people that didn't want to take the injections, this was the alternative. Mm -hmm. Uh, how effective is it in comparison? Would you say it had similar effectiveness, but there were some complications. Um, since you're taking it orally, it's going to pass through your liver twice and it could create some, um, issues with kidneys. So that's what they saw. They, they did see some, um, unfavorable side effects with uh, renal uh, patients and, and some uh, acute renal issues. So um, it may put a bigger strain on the kidneys if you're, if you're doing the oral versus the injection. And so if we take a step over to the, the most recent, which would be the Manjaro and the Zepam, these are the true Zepatides. And so what's the difference between this and some agonistide? These are GLP-1 and GIP agonists. And so GIP is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, uh, which in terms of incretimimetics, what these are, are essentially the hormones that are going to be released following a meal, and they are going to regulate your blood sugar and appetite to an extent. So what we know is that you get a bigger, they call it an incretin effect from consuming food orally than if you were to have it, say, infused during a TPN or something like that. And so there's something with the gut brain barrier that is stimulating a larger response of these hormones. Now, with that being said, between the GLP ones and the GIP, it's thought that of this incretin effect, two thirds of that is on the GIP, the glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. So the semaglutide wasn't capturing that two-third chunk. And so the terzepatide sought to do that. So they have. Um, and so from the data that have come out, it does appear that, you know, essentially dose for dose, one to one, the terzepatide is a little bit more effective in terms of weight loss um, than semaglutide. That doesn't mean the semaglutide is not effective. <laughs> um, yeah. It just means that, you know, that they were a little bit more um, effective but uh, I think it's also important to mention Husimia that's been around for over 10 years. Uh, this is not a head-to-head -head comparison, but if you look at their data and the newer data on the terzepatide, at the 40-week mark, the weight loss in each population of subjects was pretty similar. So that's huge. Yes, that's huge right. in terms of cost, I would say, right? Because I can imagine yeah. um, Husimia being 
cheaper, right? <laughs> By about seven times. So <laughs> there we go. I, I want to say, and don't quote me on this, but I want to say that Kissimmee is around the $75 a month um, for the brand name cost, I believe, uh, for, for the cost share anyway. Um, and the terzepatides upwards of, you know, twelve, thirteen hundred dollars. So, and that's if you can find it, because there are some shortages um, in yeah, manufacturing right now, right? If yeah, you guys haven't um, known. I mean, obviously, Ozempic has has been has been really hot, but the alternative right now that's essentially getting a little bit more hotter is Zepbound, which is the terzepatide, as opposed to yeah. as opposed to the uh, the semaglutides. Yeah, so uh, Zepbound's a Lily product, um, and so it, Zepbound and Manjaro are essentially both through Zepatide, different indications. So Manjaro is going to be considered the um, indicator for, for type 2 diabetes, the same way Ozempic is. And then you have Zepbound, which is indicated for obesity, same way Wagovi is. Um, the indication in terms of like guidelines is a BMI of 30 or more, or 27 or more with comorbidities. So that is typically the level at which they're they're being um, provided to patients. On the type two diabetes, it's an A1C of eight. Um, although I think there is the, these are guidelines. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, it, but if someone has, say, cardiovascular complications, or they have, um, you know, a BMI of of twenty seven or more, they could get any of these products essentially theoretically um even if their a1c was not eight so so you just have to essentially have one of these to meet to to get a prescription correct yeah. and, and you should be working with your provider i mean you know your your, your provider is going to make that decision with you for what's going to be best for your situation if this is the route you're looking to go um you know they all are going to have reported side effects to some degree um, the semaglutide and trisepatide, there have been some gastro, gastric distress. Um, of, they've had patients drop out because of it. Now it's a pretty small percentage of their research population that has discontinued because of that. But um, it's also not been studied in patients who have some sort of gastric disorder. Um, so, you know, if you have IBS, I mean, they, you know, this is not like a known they haven't studied it in that population. So there are no data to, to say with whether or not you're gonna be okay with that. Um, and so the other thing is there's not a lot of data on using them in conjunction. Theoretically, you could use terzeptide, semaglutide with a Qsimia product because um, they're not necessarily competing compounds. Would that be favorable? We don't necessarily have a, a clinical trial or data to suggest that, but you know, I think it's, it comes back to what's right for the person in their situation, taking it all their, you know, what what are they comfortable doing? <laughs> Both from a health standpoint and a financial standpoint. And, you know, I think it's also important to understand the semaglutide and trisepatide, these are pretty long-term commitments. So it doesn't change the cellular metabolism. So if you come off of these, these compounds, there is a pretty big chance that you'll put the weight back on. And <laughs> because they are hormones, there, there's going to be some fluctuation there. So you may even have a rebound if you come off where all of a sudden you're ravishingly hungry when you weren't for a while, right? So um, there are some trade-offs here, short and long-term. The pentamine to pyramid products are more of a short-term cycles is probably the best way to have people think about it. Like you'll go on it for a period of time, come off, go on it for a period of time. The thing with that is that because the venture means it's a stimulant, it's, it's just like coffee or anything else, you're gonna become a little bit accustomed to it. So it may not be as effective in subsequent doses. So the the incretin hormones are gonna be a little bit different. Back to, that, the, to like the venture mean, right? If they, were, if they were to essentially cycle off for a while, it would, um, would you say would, you know, resensitize the receptors and things like that and then become effective again? To a point, yeah. Um, it's just the the, the baseline is going to be a little bit different. So it's it's the same as you know the, the caffeine on the coffee. If you've never had caffeine and you take it, it's going to work really well, and you're going to need a real small dose. But the more you take it, the more you need to get that stimulus. And even if you came off, you'd resensitize to a point, but you'd never be back to where you were when you never had. It, right. So that's awesome. Which and, is 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So that 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 speaks to a lot of people, you know, because there's um a lot of patients, a lot of patients in the, in the bariatric space have have gone through a lot of these drugs and still had to have surgery, you know, because it didn't work. For those that have trialed and failed prior to surgery with with uh, things like Ozempic or Zepbound, what do you think? What do you think the biggest factors would be on that? I don't know if we, and I say we as a medical community, scientific community, I don't know if we have the appropriate support yet um, for for everyone. <laughs> you know, I think there are some great programs out there. I think there's some great coaches out there like yourself um, and, and some really good systems in place, but we may not be able to capture everybody um, and meet the needs of, of all of these people. And I think that it's important for people to understand, like, if something didn't work, that's not the end of the world. You know, a lot of people may look at us or, or me and think, you know, this guy doesn't know anything about having to lose weight. Well, I, I, I do. Um, I was the fat kid in high school. I lost over 90 pounds, I would say. Um, I quit weighing myself. I was so big. And I did it all the wrong ways. And it took a lot of trial and error. And there was a lot of failure. So I think that that's something to let people know is that just because something didn't work, there's many paths to the same destination. So trying to find something that's going to work for you. It may not be, you know, a, a drug. It might be something else that needs to be changed or a couple things. And so it gets really complicated. So um, I'd say, you know, finding a team to work with is probably going to be the most important for those folks is I agree. You know, find a practice. Yeah, a team that is going to help you find the pieces of the puzzle, right? Because that's what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of it is, it's not, well, a lot of people see it as one factor, but it's, it's not, it's, you know, multifactoral. And a lot of it has to do with your mindset, your psychology, what your history looks like, your lifestyle, the stress that you're dealing with at home, you know, and then also the percentage of people that are not telling the truth about what they're really eating as well too, you know, but that's something that you'd have to unpeel, I guess, in, in their yeah. field. Like, that's another. Yeah. <laughs> for those who are considering jumping on one of these drugs or compounds after bariatric surgery, what would you recommend? That's going to be really individualized. <laughs> and I would say it's going to be between them and their, their surgeon slash care team. Um, just because, you know, after bariatric surgery, a lot of people are going to experience some sort of gastric distress anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been a lot of changes now after that surgery. And so introducing one of these new compounds, it may not be as effective or work the same way now because you've had this pretty drastic change in your 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 gut physiology. So it, it it's yeah. one of those that it's yeah. hard to say. I mean, yeah, yeah. There, there's going to be pros and cons to everything. You know, I can see how the a product like Fentramine to Pyramid might be beneficial because if it's reducing your your appetite and want to have food because now you have to take your quantities down so low, I could see that being very helpful. Um, the semaglutide, trisepatide, you know, that may have the same effect. It may not to the same extent because it's not as immediate of a feeling. Um, I don't know if I would go with an oral <laughs> semaglutide after bariatric, but some people might handle it really well. So I think it just kind of depends. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Do you, have you have you dealt with any any patients directly with with using this and like successful patients? Oh yeah, there, there's a lot of success, and I think that that's probably something we should. <laughs> have. More people are successful than are unsuccessful with with all of these approaches, right? I mean, the, the bad stuff gets the headlines lately um, because it's compelling and, you know, oh my gosh, there's there's all this awful stuff and the sky's falling and that gets ratings. But most people you're not hearing about because everything's great. So they're not, you know, writing a blog about their excellent experience necessarily. They're out living life, right? <laughs> so, I know a lot of things weight management wise, you know, it's like people like to complain essentially, but you don't hear about the successes and the victories. Because they're busy, yeah. <laughs> they're busy living living a great life now. So um, you know that that's something to consider is the, the and, and the side effects that come along with these. I mean, they're they're very reasonable if you compare them across the board to other therapies and treatments. You know, it's not like some weird proportion or anything like that. It's just with some people, they they may not 
respond the same way to them and that could affect you know their their treatment and so um i think it goes back to you know the the cornerstone of all this is still the lifestyle change and i think what all these things do is provide somewhat of like well, a not feedback, feedback right like a positive yeah. feedback to where you want to or you're motivated now to to do things to to get active to kind of like take a little bit more action is that what you're saying yeah. And it takes practice to do that stuff, right? Like these lifestyle changes, you don't just snap your fingers and have them happen. <laughs> I think that's the misconception too, is that, you know, you're not going to just all of a sudden change everything about your lifestyle and the way you do things and what you eat and, and everything. Cause it, it's, it's all of it, right? It's how you sleep. It's how you go about your day. It's how you, you know, prep your meals or don't prep your meals, right? Like there's all these things that need to happen and all that takes practice. And I think these allow some initial change while that practice is, is being perfected terrible word there but you know what i mean like as you're getting better at it because that's what it takes um because i'm big on progress over perfection all day long like consistency is key <laughs> compliance is the science like that's you know yes. um but that that's what i think this gives people is some sort of a and jump starts not the right word either i hate using that but essentially it it does give them some initial results though where they may not always get that with Hey, I just added, you know, an extra hour of quality sleep. Like you may not notice the benefit right away and then it, it's not as exciting. You know, it's not as sexy <laughs> as, as, Hey, I dropped eight pounds this week. Right. Like that's a, that's a big deal. So I think that's what it gives people is, is that added help um, while they're going through these other things and figuring out the real long-term changes that, that need to be made. Have you worked with any programs that prescribe this to, um, and what I'm getting at is, do these programs provide that extra level of counseling, I would say, beyond just the drug or the compound? Personally, I haven't, but I've seen, I believe Weight Watchers is working with it now um, to a degree. And, you know, I think Weight Watchers has a great support system. I think that's something they've always done really well. Um, you know, just having that weekly touch point is huge for accountability because that's the other thing comes down to but you also have access to this network of people that's not even necessarily your coach or instructor or provider that you know can help you <laughs> stay accountable and create you know new ideas or be creative to find ways to be successful so from that standpoint i think it's you know highly highly effective and if we just step back and look at the approaches to these types of systems you know there's a meta-analysis done i want to say back in 2015 looking at how like these programs implemented were in terms of effectiveness for, for weight loss. And so they looked at essentially four different categories and it was um, provider alone. So that could be either a doctor or a dietitian. Uh, there was technology alone. So that could be either a website or an app, but there was no like human interaction. Then they looked at like the group setting, um, which would be like a Weight Watchers where you'll have human interaction, but it might not be somebody credentialed. And then they looked at the group setting plus meal plans, which is essentially like the Jenny Craig, where same thing, your coach may not be a credentialed person, but you have access on a regular basis and there's prepackaged meals. And the most successful program by far was the Jenny Craig with the group of people may not even be credentialed and they had prepackaged meals. The least successful by a lot was the practitioner alone. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't listen to practitioners, right? Because I think that's what the knee-jerk reaction is to that is, well, practitioners don't know what to talk about. A lot of that goes back to, I think, <laughs> what was captured in that was the amount of time that the patient got access. Typically, a patient doesn't get a lot of time or access to their practitioner. They might get 20 minutes. They might get an hour you know, and they might get that hour every few months or twice a year if they're lucky. Whereas with the Jenny or the Weight Watchers, they're getting it weekly with someone and they may even be able to create new relationships so that they're ch checking in with one of their friends every single day. So I think that that's the real takeaway there is that more the accountability, right? It's the, yeah, accountability I'm going to the frequency to be able to to have somebody that you're doing this with. And then also that accountability on each other, but then also the convenience of having something provided for you too. So I, it would that definitely makes sense, and and that can be applied to everything across the board in terms of weight management as well too. Because you can literally look up anything 
and you can get any diet. You can listen to anybody on YouTube or, or uh, any anything like that. But if you don't have that accountability, um, it's going to be difficult to succeed. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I agree with that, uh, with that 100 percent. It's just the, the takeaway, I feel like, <laughs> was kind of skewed in terms of, yeah, don't listen to the doctor. They don't know. It's like, no, maybe you just didn't hear it and you need to hear it every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, on the other side of it, to be fair, I mean, a lot of MDs in, in their training, in their formal training, they don't necessarily get extensive nutrition training. So that is, true. That, that, is that is like a thing. But, you know, at the other side of it, that doesn't mean they don't know <laughs> a lot about what's going on. So I, that's why I say a care team. You know, I think that's something that you don't hear a lot in the industry, and, and, and especially in the fitness world. It's all about hire this one coach. You probably need more than one. You know, if we're being really honest, I, you know, I, my background is exercise physiology and nutrition. I would much rather just focus on one of those for a client. I can easily do both. Right. But I mean, I, if you really, really want to get specific about some things, I mean, you know, we've trained some really high level athletes and there are some of them. I'm not going to train somebody to be a better wrestler. That's not my background. Right. Like I can train them to be stronger and everything, but when it, when it comes down to the technique and technical aspects of wrestling, we're bringing in another coach for that, you know? And so um, that's where I think that people should probably approach their health the same way. We have different disciplines and different specialties and things like that for a reason. And so finding a, a good mix that will gel well together is, is probably a really good approach. 100%. I like that. I like that. And I'm the same way as well, too, in terms of, um, yeah, trying to accomplish it all. And even if, if uh, you did work with me, it's like, but you don't want to offend me by seeking somebody else like, hey, let me make it easy on you. You're gonna learn something new. I guarantee it, go for it. You know, you, this is your life, you know, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna offend me in any way by by uh, not using me in, in your next show or what have you, but. I'm gonna get a bikini professional to help my clients learn how to pose for bikini, right? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> 100%. Um, what else do you wanna say about Ozempic? in terms of uh, considerations for bariatric patients or a uh, ZEP bound or anything like that? I, I think it's just important to remember that they're, they're an alternative to lifestyle or an additive to lifestyle, right? Like lifestyle is still the cornerstone. That should still be the main goal is making those changes, figuring out how to make those changes if you don't know how. And I think that can be a lot more difficult than people think. You know, it sounds really simple, you know, and honestly, weight loss, you know, to a degree is a very simple thing. It's a very simple equation, but it's not easy. Right. So Actually, I do have a, another question on that. It's the for a patient that is struggling in terms of I can't seem to get it under control. Right. I've already had surgery. Where let's let's say the, the gastric sleeve. My my stomach is reduced. My my hunger hormone is should be diminished, you know, but. I still keep going back to um, potato chips or eating these foods and I can't seem to uh, get under control. Will one of these compounds help me? That's, I feel like that's where a lot of, the, uh, a lot of uh, patients struggling are gonna be asking. They might and they might not. And I realize that that's not necessarily maybe yeah. what they wanna hear, um, but it's, it's the truth, right? I mean, it might be one of those where, you know, if, if there's triggers, it, it may not be the drug that's the catalyst. It might be just not having those things around and figuring out a way to not get to them. We do the same thing kind of with, with sleep. Um, you know, we have some athletes that they're getting ready for a major, major competition. I mean, their significant other doesn't even sleep in the same room because we don't want their sleep interrupted. Right. I mean, there's some pretty drastic measures or people would view as drastic that sometimes it's necessary to get to where you want to be. Right. And so um, I think that, the, the compound, you know, if, if your doctor thinks it's appropriate, if, give it a try, right? I mean, that's the only way you're going to find out. Um, but if it doesn't work, then it might be one of those like more psychological know. or environmental, you know, that that's that's really causing causing that. The self-discipline thing, you know, you're going to lose that battle all day. We we do also, right? I mean, um, but so that's why I say taking inconvenient yeah, take, taking the measures that you need to for yourself to, so that you are not sitting there with that bag of chips or whatever it is right or you know making sure you're not you know 
whatever the, whatever it is, right? Whatever the behavior is, it just eliminate that or make it very very difficult to to do it. Yeah. And, and it's gonna they're gonna have to do that for an extended period of time to the point where it's gonna be uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think that that's the other thing is, and I think that we all struggle with this is living in that place of being uncomfortable to make change. Um, but sometimes that's what's necessary. I always say, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. <laughs> you know, so yeah. when you're comfortable, exactly. that's when there's a problem and you're going to start uh, dipping down into a place you don't want to be, or at least have regret. That's another one too, right? Suffer the pain of discipline or suffer the pain of regret. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. And I, and, and I feel like it, it's going to answer a lot of questions or at least, at least get some people moving in the direction if they were considering or questioning these um this approach you know um but on on generally speaking right you're saying the data is showing that the um like the zep bound is uh, and those those drugs are going to be a little bit more effective on on paper right to date that's what we see now i i would expect as we see these data spread out longer term, there's probably gonna be a terminal point where they're all pretty effective depending on the time period, right? So, you know, this these were looking at uh, 56 weeks, but there was like a four week lead in. So we're looking at like a one year time frame. We don't have data for the three to five year, <laughs> but at three to five years, we could see that they're all similar in terms of weight loss. So- um, You can also you know, see but that, more side effects down the line as well too. Yes and no. So because my first, you know, thought around these were, OK, if you're manipulating the way that the pancreas is, you know, secreting these hormones, what does that do for potential pancreatitis or complications from that? And there are data around the safety of that. And it looks like these will actually reduce the um, incidence of pancreatitis, which was surprising. Um, but it seems to have a protective effect. So there is that, but again, it goes back to, you know, as compared to what, right? So as we compare, and again, it wasn't a head-to-head -head trial, but if I compare the Qsimia data at 40 weeks to the 40 weeks of, you know, of um, truth the, the weight loss was pretty similar. <clears throat> and so even if the terzepatide was, you know, a pound or two more, is that worth seven times or more in cost? Oh. Um, or, you know, and then you can change like, well, is it worth less or more side effects, right? So it depends on the context that you put everything in. And I think that that's the other thing that we haven't really touched on in this conversation, but it all comes back to the context, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, you absolutely. Have to, absolutely. Yeah, what's, you have the, what's the compound of Qsimia again? That's the fentramine to pyramid. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's wild. That's actually, that's, that's, <laughs> that's really surprising too, you know, like considering the cost and it's, I mean, uh, I could be wrong, but it, it could be just the popularity and the name and the demand, you know, of it that, that's, uh, that makes it that, that price. When you say that they were very similar, would you say like a 5% uh, margin? Oh, let me see if I can look at it real quick. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say within 5%. So we're talking around a 25 pound loss um and of this of this uh sample the test subjects were were they uh like what was their like bmi or anything like that what, what were the uh the criteria that's where it, it might be a little bit different so with the qsimia it was called the equip, equip trial and it was 56 week randomized uh 1267 adults with class two or class three obesity Okay. Um, and so their mean BMI was 42. Their mean age was almost 43. Um, 83% were women, um, 80% were white, um, and their baseline weight was 116 kilograms. So, um, it's around 240 pounds where the, um, Incretin mimetic. So th this is one of the trials. So this was surpassed two, and they've done four. Um, surpassed two looked at uh, terzepatide uh, and compared it against semaglutide. So that's why I used this one. So this was a 40 week open label. Um, for it was open label in the, in the fact that because the um, injection pens <laughs> look very um, specific to each product you couldn't blind which one it was 
um, but they were able to blind the dosage. And so they randomized 1,879 patients. Uh, this was with type 2 diabetes. And so their mean baseline A1C was 8.3. Um, and the mean baseline weights uh, was around 205 pounds. Okay. And did they have like a mean BMI? That's what I was trying to see if there was one on here that I could find real quick. Okay, so mean age was 54, 48% women. They'd had diabetes for four to seven years and their BMI was 32. So on the lower side on the BMI. Yeah, because um, the other one was... But this was for, for, uh, for diabetes. Right, because it was looking at Manjaro. So that's why they did it that way. The weight loss was the secondary endpoint. Um, yeah, because the Qsimian BMI was 42. So, yeah, you're talking about a, a BMI difference of 10. So if you have a higher BMI, you may have more to lose. Or you may lose it easier. I don't know if that's the wrong word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. Yeah, and that's why, like I said, it, it's not a head-to-head -head trial, so you can't really compare. Um, it's not appropriate to do that. But if you look at the weight loss um, at that time frame, um, it was pretty similar. So they had, at 40 weeks, they had lost almost 14 kilograms in the Fentramita pyramid. So that's in line with the roughly 25 pounds that was lost on the the terzepatide. Well, that's good, man. So yeah, they're sounds like they're effective. It's just that that long term, and also knowing that if you come off of it, you're gonna be um, you can be affected, right? Just like any any hormones or anything like that for pregnancy and things like that, you're gonna have some issues with your hormones. You come them off, come off of it. Your same thing is gonna happen as well too. Testosterone, right? Unless you unless you continue, it's gonna be you're going to start feeling the negative effects or you can rebound or go very low also in terms of hormonal situations. Yeah. And, and again, it, it's what we're, what we're focusing on for that rebound, because you, I mean, theoretically you could say, well, this could desensitize you to insulin secretion a little bit because now you're implementing it exogenously. However, if you have somebody that loses 10% of their body weight, they might be more sensitive to the insulin that is released. So you may have yeah. an offsetting. So it may not matter when they come off. Um, so it really kind of depends. <laughs> no, I say the same thing in terms of like your metabolic rate, right? It's like, okay, you lose you lose a ton of weight. Your, your uh, BMR is going to drop, but it's also, it shouldn't affect you like psychologically because knowing that your lower BMI is going to be supporting a lower weight as well too. And essentially- Percentage wise, you're gonna be, you're still gonna be pretty consistent. It's not like you're just gonna gain all this weight back because your your metabolism has decreased slightly. Right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, it's just going back to old habits, right? It always comes back to old yeah. habits. And that that's a big takeaway, just just making sure that you through all of this, this is not a one factor deal. You have to, you have to develop new habits, you have to develop new mindset, you have to um, eat better foods, more nutritious foods, be in a caloric deficit, get some activity, water, you know, take your supplements and, and all of those, all of those things too. I say, I say supplements more so for the bariatric side, because of mm -hmm. course if you have more room. Of course you can, <laughs> you can get it all from food as well too, but yeah, <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's really helpful. I think, I think we should definitely have like a follow-up conversation as well too. You know, uh, for sure. Because the data is going to change. We're going to get more data. It may not change, but there's going to be more data to discuss. And not only that, uh, me and me and Damon actually were right before recording talking about what he's working on right now in terms of like Parkinson's or um, there, there was uh, something related to weight also. I, f I forget, but it was it was really interesting. What was it in terms of uh, weight management? 
Uh, it's well, it's going to be a, a treat. Well, it's a, it's a drug, um, and it's for. It's going to be designed that there's going to be different indications, and so one of the indications, the goal is for binge eating disorder. Binge eating, uh, but it's also, that's the one. Yeah, yeah uh, but it's it's also potentially for. It could be used for um, Alzheimer's, um, ALS, um, and then I'm working on a separate compound for for Parkinson's right now. It's first of its kind, so. Um, really cool stuff out there. And I, I, you know, just for the audience that, that may not be as familiar with, with biotech or pharma, you know, it, it is incredibly <laughs> uh, expensive and time consuming to bring a drug to market. And so um, keep that in mind as, as we kind of reveal these things. The, the fact that the Fentramitopyramid has been out for well over, I think it's 12 years now. That is a long time for a compound to be out. And so what that does with it being on the market that long is it it gives us more information about efficacy and safety where, you know, some of these other ones we're, we're still learning. <laughs> um, and, and on the other side of that coin, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars that get invested into one compound uh, becoming commercialized. And then, you know, the company has to also deal with the fact that that patent is going to run out and they're going to have all this competition so um send me a to, video, right so it's going to be yeah, trying to recoup yeah. that cost <laughs> so um you know it's a very tough game to to be in um and and these companies takes just enormous risks i mean there's i've, I've been involved with others recently um that didn't make it and they had a really 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 good product um so there's just, you know, a lot of things that go on out there outside of, hey, this is a really good treatment. <laughs> you know, there's still an, an economics to it, to everything, you know. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to do what we can. And I think these are some additional tools that really help. So hopefully we'll That's something we'll be able to, big to consider that you that you mentioned, too, because with shortages and the very high demand, you may actually be forced to slow down or stop or or have to take a, a break. And I mean to continue the conversation. What what do you think would happen too under those circumstances? Of, um, I'm seeing results. I love it, and but man, there's a shortage, and I have to be off of it for a month. What um, some things to consider? I don't think. Yeah, I don't think a month is going to be a big deal um, in terms of like rebound or things like that. That should be fine. What we are seeing that might be of concern or just something to consider is that there are some third party uh, formularies that we're putting these things together. Um, and I think a lot of them have shut down at this point um, because essentially they were taking these drugs like semaglutide and creating a proprietary blend of it. And so they were selling it at fractions uh, of I've a dollar. Seen, and, I've seen it on online. I actually got like, you know, got hit with the, with the target marketing on it. And it's like, Hey, you want to get, you know, semaglutide and just, Add it to the cart. I'm like, what? <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> so I, I would call. I, I my concern there is that there are a lot of scams. Um, you know, there were some places that were probably really legit. What I'll say is that they are regulated a little bit differently, um, and there was a lawsuit. Uh, and I think that's why a lot of them have shut down now. And understandably so. I understand both sides of the coin here, but it's essentially, you know. Semaglutide is Novo's compound. They created that. They spent those billions and billions of dollars on creating that compound. And so now, like, to have somebody else just put it into a formula at whatever dose they want to and combine it with some other compounds that we don't have data on the safety if you combine it with that, um, you know, I could see where Novo gets concerned about, well, if something goes wrong, you're going to sue us because it's our compound, right? So um, so I could see where the the concern comes in. and We saw in the fitness industry, right? I mean, we've had that for a long time. There, there were companies that were trying to sell you HGH in a bottle and take it orally, and that's not possible. Um, but if it had the right amino acids in there on the ingredient label, they could legally call it that. And so that's where I would say, you know, just try to get it through a regular pharmacy. They are having some struggles. I think a lot of it has been either remedied or they are at the point where they're really trying to put in new processes to accommodate because <laughs> I don't think even they knew how popular it was going to be. Um, so, you know, I think we'll yeah, see that resolve. I always question like, if this is not a reputable company, do you really know what you're injecting or eating or <laughs> consuming, right? These are, you're still messing with, with drugs at the end of the day. 
yeah, it's like, you know, getting your insulin from some guy in the corner is, <laughs> you know, you don't want to do it. <laughs> Hey, my insulin is not working today. <laughs> it's like, where'd you get it? <laughs> John, or it's working real well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. No, that's that's uh, very very important to 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 really consider if you are questioning the cost and but you really want it. Is it worth it? Is is always going to be you know. So don't gamble with your health. Don't gamble with your life when it comes down to that stuff. Go with what's perfect. Right. Or studied extensively because <laughs> there's nothing is 100%. Um, anything else you want to add? Well, I, you know, the, the three takeaways for me, yeah. you know, main takeaway one, one is that all of these treatments are secondary lifestyle change. And so find things that you can be consistent with. And that would be my number two, you know, consistency and progress over perfection. And in order to do that, would be my number three make your health a priority and seek qualified advice from a team probably um, rather than just one person and part of that team might be your family it might be your significant other it might just be emotional support right they need to be on board um <laughs> if you're constantly being sabotaged that's another thing you're going to have to work through and, and coach through so um like we talked about earlier it's a it's a simple idea but it's not easy to to execute so uh, so get help no i like that do you have, uh, where can people find you? They can find me online. Um, I'm not currently accepting new patients, but alliedperformance.com, um, LLC.com, sorry. Um, and I'm on Instagram, Dr. Damon McCune on Instagram. Right, Dr. Damon McCune on Instagram. Any plugs you wanna, you wanna plug? Vertical diet. <laughs> Uh, so you can get a copy of the vertical diet on Amazon. Um, we tried to make that as extensive and comprehensive as possible. Um, and it's one of those that can be can just changed and, and basically tailored to your lifestyle and your needs. Um, and we try to make it as straightforward and practical as possible. So it's not a bunch of biochemistry and, and all these other things. It's actually practical, useful ideas. So I, know, um, I can attest to that too. I've, I've read the vertical diet and it, it's actually very much what I practice on a regular basis as well, too, without a label, you know, essentially um, talking about the nutrition density of foods and, and how to get that uh, and then a balanced balance diet as well, too. So very good. Yeah, full approach, uh, evidence based. We have over 500 citations in there. <laughs> Probably have have more in our next iteration because there's more that's come out. But <laughs> all the all the big rocks still still apply. So. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the Ride Life podcast. I would definitely love to have you on again. And I mean, an hour essentially went by, you know, and, and we there's still essentially more questions that that, that can be uh, delved into. So uh, yeah, we'll thanks for having me. Anytime. I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much. He's, uh, he's coming from, uh, we're talking from Texas. I'm in Las Vegas. He's in Texas right now. So <laughs> uh, super cool. All right. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you. I do have one thing to add before I wrap it up. Speaking of accountability, if you're struggling and would like me to provide you with a plan and hold you accountable, just shoot me an email at support at the right life.com. Again, that's support at the right life.com to schedule a chat. I do have limited spots available for new patients. So if you're ready to take action, just ask. Until then, I'll see you in the next. Peace. This was another episode of The Right Life Podcast. For more motivation and future episodes with Alex, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any life-changing moments.